So it's my pleasure to introduce La Laura Shaposnik from the University of Illinois at Chicago, who will speak on generalized hyperpolygons. Thank you, Jesus, uh, for inviting me. I can't believe, I think we met maybe over a decade, almost two decades ago, uh, time flies. Uh, it's an honor to be part of your seminar series of SAG. And to tell you a little bit about my recent work, uh, it's going to be a mix of things that I want to do today. So I want to tell you mainly about some work that I've done with Steve Ryan that we finished recently on hyperpolygon spaces and their relations to my previous work on Hitchin systems. And in particular, our hyperpolygons are defined for a special type of quiver, uh, which we introduced in our, one of our last papers. And time permitting, I'm going to finish the talk by telling you about the beginning of our current project on applications of these hyperpolygon uh, stories. So let me show you um, what the plan is for today. I want to start by telling you what uh, are generalized hyperpolygons and review some ideas of quiver varieties. Then I want to consider uh, the relationship with Higgs bundles and Hitchin systems, since this is part of why I started studying the topic. And then we're going to look into the appearance of integrable systems within the space of generalized hyperpolygons. And once now that we are going to be more familiar with Hitchin systems, we're going to go and look into the study of brains, both of Higgs bundles and hyperpolygon spaces, and use the hypercalar structures that appear for that. And finally, I want to finish the talk, so use the last quarter of the talk or so, to tell you a bit more about the other bits of work that I've been doing that I, I've started a few years ago trying to apply the geometric techniques that I have acquired over the years into a, a solving problems in other uh, areas of science, math, uh, physics, but other areas of science in particular. So I want to tell you a little bit with the hopes that that will also inspire you to look into the techniques that you've learned uh, and how you can apply them to other things. So the papers that I'm going to be talking mostly about, in case you are want to find them, are the following. They on the left, you see the paper where we define generalized hyperpolygons, which we prepared to honor um, Sir Michael Atiyah. And then we also published this uh, last year a note on hyperpolygons in the notices of the AMS that will have a lot of information, like the starting points. And finally, there is another article in the notices of the AMS, Higgs bundles and recent applications from last year, that I prepared with a lot of open directions and open problems that I find interesting and which um, hopefully other people will find enlightening. So let's start. Um, even though there are many experts here on the subject and on, on um, quivers in particular, I want to make sure we're on the same page. So I want to start from the very beginning with some details about quiver varieties. The modelized space of hyperpolygons appears as a Nakajima quiver variety uh, of star shapes quivers. And we're going to use a similar construction to that of quivers to build the space of hyperpolygons. So I want to do a quick recap of how we do this. So let's start with just the first, the, the easiest quiver. Um, take the quiver A1 with two vertices U and V, and the labels are U and RV. And then the space of representations is the homomorphisms between C to the RU and C to the RV, like you see here. Now the corresponding Nakajima quiver uh, we are going to double it, and we can now interpret the space of representations as the cotangent space to those homomorphisms. And this can be viewed as a direct sum of the two spaces of homomorphisms between the copies of C, parametrizing the two arrows that we have where we think of the reverse direction Y as being the cotangent direction. So then to construct the corresponding moduli space, we will consider the symplectic reduction associated, which will be then generalized to our generalized hyperpolygons. So we're going to look at this symplectic reduction and how it works. To do this to each quiver, we're going to associate a real and a complex moment map, mu and u, that take the space of representations of the double quiver to the dual of the Lie algebras and their complexification. And these moment maps are associated with the complex adjoint action of a group G that is this one, and it's built from the action of groups on each of the nodes. 
uh, on the central node, so remember we have a star shape type quiver. On the central node B, we have the action of U of R V acting by left or right multiplication. And on the central node, we have the action of S U R. So to see how this works, let's go back to our example uh, of the two vertices and see how we build these uh, moment maps. We can build these maps in the whole quiver by just attaching the actions on each of these nodes. Uh, in this case of the double of, of just the two nodes, the real moment map on X and Y is the difference between X star and X and Y and Y star, where the asterisk, the star, means the constant transpose. And we can pretend it lives in the correct Lie algebra by just scaling appropriately. The complex moment map is then just the product of X and Y. So now, for the Nakajima query varieties to build them, uh, when we are building the Nakajima query variety, we can see it constructed through the moment maps, and it's an affine hyperkähler variety. So given one a quiver Q, which is not yet double, we first consider the quotient space of representations by the group G, which is the product of GL of RV, like you see here for each node B of the quiver. Then to get the Nakajima quiver variety, we are doubling the quiver itself. Uh, we restrict the dual of the representation variety to the intersection of the two level sets obtained via the moment maps that we just constructed. And we take the hyperkähler quotient. Our group now uh, that you see here is taken to be the product of the maximal compacts for each vertex. And we then take the level set of the real moment map for a central element alpha uh, and the level set of the complex moment map at zero, like you see here. And this central element alpha will appear again when we are doing the when we do the generalization to generalize hyperpolygons. The space that we get has very nice geometry from work of Hitchin, and Carl, uh, Linsom and Rurik. The space has a hyperkähler structure, where the complex structure I comes from U and the complex structure J and K come from U. So how do we go now into generalized hyperpolygons? Um, our interest is on the generalized version of hyperpolygons. Hyperpolygons themselves are built from A-type quivers. Uh, so we're going to look at the simplest case first of a black variety that comes from choosing an A-type quiver with M nodes, as we have here, with labels one to R and integers in between in increasing order. Uh, the Nakajima queer variety is given by the dual of the partial flag variety, and we're doubling the arrows in our, in our quiver. We're going to consider the, uh, the labels of each of the arrows, just like we did before. And uh, we're going to consider the underlying R, like you see here, as the vector of labels of our quiver. And so it's integers from one to R. The groups now in question, uh, which we're going to use for the moment maps, in this case, Rg uh, that you see here, which is the product of the U of R i's for the vertices, for the vertex uh, quotient is by plus or minus one, uh, but not the one with the biggest label R. So we're taking the central node away. And, and then we're going to consider the center, which is the sum of the dual of the Lie algebras for the non-central nodes. So to construct our moment map, we're going to consider the level set for which uh, that comes from all of the nodes except for the central node and take all of them to be zero except for the node with a one and that's going to be our alpha. Um, yes, and we're going to extend that to our generalized uh, hyperpolygon where we're going to have all of the, we're going to have many copies of this type of quiver all together. These uh, hyperpolygons are built from considering, say, n many different A-type quivers, not necessarily with the same flag, uh, and we're actually not going to take the same flag on purpose, and we're going to join them all together at the central node, and we're going to do just like before, give the R label to the central node, and we're going to build the space of generalized hyperpolygons uh, by first adding G many loops. So this is hyperpolygons that you see here, we're going to add G many loops, uh, to make the generalized version. The generalized version will allow us to think about, uh, if you want, connections on, um, on uh, Riemann surfaces that have higher genus. Uh, and I'll tell you more about the relationship uh, later on. So 
We're adding these Gmany loops. We then are going to consider the double quiver, like you see here with doubled arrows. And in the central node, we're going to restrict the action to the SUR action. And we're going to fix the labels just as before with choices of alpha i's now. There are many, one for each node, which has a one at the end. And these are going to be our hypercalar parameters. And so to define the Nakajima query variety of, the, of this comma, uh, we're going to do it as the product of the dual spaces of the flag varieties for each of the arms together, uh, like you see here, together with, um, uh, with the space coming from the other nodes. So together with the cotangent space coming from the nodes quotiented by the SUR action. Uh, and the loops come, remember, the loops come from the SLRC that you have in the central node, and there's G of them, and so we have these cotangent space that's the cotangent to SLRC to the G, because we have G of them. And the quotient is taken via the moment maps, as before, by considering the level set at zero and the level set for the hypercalar parameters alpha. So the first thing we need to think about when building the space of generalized hyperpolygons uh, that we did with Steve Ryan was how to build these moment maps. Uh, so let me just give you an example uh, so we can start thinking about how to build these moment maps. To construct uh, the appropriate maps, which will then lead to an appropriate modular space with good geometric conditions like we want, it's useful to understand how the loops of the comet uh, contribute to the action. At the central node, say that we call it star, we have n arms indexed by i, since the central node only directly interacts uh, with the node of each arm, we're just going to take the i away and we're just going to call them x and y. Um, the real moment map mu uh, at, at the central node star is the sum of the real moment maps at each of the arms sum to the commutators of a loop arrow and its reversed one. And this is for all the loops at the central node. And you should note that we're taking the traceless part of this, and so we're going to put a zero there. Now, the complex moment map is the sum of the complex moment maps for that node at each of the arms summed to the commutators of each loop arrow, and it's doubled, like you see here. So the generalized hyperpolygon space is then constructed through the level sets at zero of the corresponding complex and real moment maps and modding out by SUR action. So what we get here is what you see. Uh, underneath. Uh, it can be shown to be uh, the space of hyperpolygons, uh, a hypercalar variety of complex dimension two times the sum of the dimension of the flag varieties plus g minus one times r square minus one, like you see here. And this is quite a nice uh, dimension for those that uh, care about representation varieties. You see that something that's expected when all of the flags are complete we will recover the expected dimension in our r minus one plus two g minus one r square minus one. Now, why do we care? Why do we call them generalized hyperpolygons? You might be wondering. And geometrically, we can think of the space of hyperpolygons of generalized hyperpolygons as parameterizing pairs of polygons where the sides have lengths determined by those values of the moment map uh, and and their and and whether they close or not. So it's in very close analogy to polygon space. And in particular, since we're working with arbitrary genus uh, or arbitrary loops, we have two N plus two G guns and N plus G guns. Um, so a bit different than the space of polygons or, or just hyperpolygons. So the space we're going to call it, uh, like you saw in the previous slide, X to the G sub R1 Rn of alpha, alpha is the parameter. And um, this space of generalized hyperpolygons uh, we're going to say has length alpha. And hyperpolygons, uh, just a bit, of, a bit of history, were first studied by Connell as a natural hypercalar extension of the space of usual polygons. And later on, Harad and Pertfoot showed that it was an Akajima queer variety in more detailed uh, way and studied in much more detail. And these spaces uh, were shown to be closely related to Higgs bundles. Uh, this was first done by for genus zero uh, Riemann surfaces by Godinho and Mantini, and for, in particular for rank two. And this was later extended by Fisher and Ryan uh, for minimal flags. So with Steve Ryan, what we wanted to do is extend this notion to consider Higgs bundles to, to consider the analogy of Higgs bundles to generalized hyperpolygons uh, on uh, Riemann surfaces of arbitrary genus, and so. 
this would allow uh, to have arbitrary, this would require us to have arbitrary loops in our generalized hyperpolygons uh, related to heat bundles in an appropriate way. So let me tell you how uh, these generalized hyperpolygons relate to Higgs bundles. So Nakajima queer varieties can be thought of as a, a finite dimensional analog of Hitchin's systems. And I want to remind you of what these uh, Hitchin equations are for those that haven't seen much of them, uh, although you've had several Zach talks on Hitchin's uh, Hitchin systems already. Uh, recall that Hitchin's Equations express both the flatness of an SLNC connection and the harmonicity condition for a metric in the resulting flat bundle. So, in particular, this appears from the two equations obtained via the real and moment and complex moment maps of generalized hyperpolygons, and that's what I want to show you here. So, what I put here on the slide the the moment maps we had built together. Uh, these two moment maps, we're going to consider them. Uh, in their level sets of zero, and we're going to reorder them to see the appearance of Hitchin's equations through them. So the failure of a polygon to close, we can think of it as uh, being the corrected by the choice we make of the cotangent data. And this is very similar to Hitchin's first equation that you see here, where the failure of a curvature to vanish for the connection is measured by the choice of a Higgs field phi. Uh, and then once that we have a connection part and a Higgs part in the first hyperpolygon equation, we can then look at the second hyperpolygon equation and see there the connection part acting on the contingent data, and so leading to an analog of Hitchin's second equation that we have there for the holomorphic um, condition. And this is their analog. So we want to actually have a more tangible um, relation between generalized hyperpolygons and Higgs bundles or Hitchin systems. So let me show you how you do that. The way we're going to associate a corresponding Higgs field to a hyperpolygon is by considering a punctured uh, surface. So let Z be a positive divisor in the upper half plane, which is styled with punctured 4G guns. Then we're going to use the X and the Y data to define the residues of the Higgs field which now is a meromorphic at uh, this function, is a meromorphic connection this function, of these functions. So uh, choosing the, the GZ of ZI appropriately as a quasi-periodic function, we can see that the quotient uh, that we're defining here for the Higgs field is well defined on the quotient of the upper half plane, but the, by the appropriate uh, Fuchsian group. So these Higgs fields are for the trivial rank R bundle on, on those surfaces, and we compactify it before we take the quotient, so we get actually a compact Riemann surface. And what we get here is the embedding, we can think of it as an embedding of, um, of spaces, of complex places, uh, which respect the complex structure i, but not the j and the k. So actually, there's a, there's a careful relation that you need to express between the hyperkähler spaces. We don't have a hyperkähler embedding here. So let me show you an example to see more hands-on how Higgs bundles and uh, hyperpolygons relate. This uh, is one of the easiest examples. We're going to consider minimal flags and Gino zero. Uh, this is the fine D4 Dinkin diagram with flags one, two for all arms. So all arms have minimal and complete flags here. The model space of um, hyperpolygons then is the K3 surface with the complete ALE metric. It's actually the space of gravitational instantons here. It embeds into the Hitchin system of parabolic Higgs bundles of rank two on P1 with four punctures. And so we have four tame singularities for the Higgs field. And the embedding, as we were mentioning before, is not of hyperkähler varieties. The difference between the two spaces is a co-dimension zero sub-variety, which is actually the Hitchin section which brings us very close to a Hitchin integrable system, which is what I want to uh, talk about next. Um, so having made contact with integrable systems, let's take a look at how the topic comes into play for generalized hyperpolygons. Um, so uh, as I was saying, given the correspondence between generalized hyperpolygons and his bundles, 
we're going to look into the appearance of integrable systems uh, within hyperpolygon spaces that would be analog to the Hitching vibration. So we should keep in mind that back in 94, Nakajima mentioned in his work that one would expect actually Nakajima queer varieties to be completely integrable Hamiltonian systems. Fisher and Ryan more recently showed that this is the case for hyperpolygons on genus zero surfaces and minimal flags for rank R less or equal to three uh, and any N. They did this by embedding the space of hyperpolygons into certain space of tame Higgs bundles on punctured on the puncture sphere. And what we're going to do now, uh, what we did with uh, Steve Bryan, I want to tell you about is how to extend this to hyperpolygons where we have comets which have complete or minimal flags, and we take any rank, any genus, and any n. So generalize to the setting where we get an analog of Higgs bundles on any uh, compact Riemann surface. Uh, so how does this construction work? Recall that the space of generalized hyperpolygons is obtained by taking the product of flag varieties and a quotient and a restriction via moment maps. The quotient can be seen to inherit the symplectic structure from the original product, but one wants to know whether the hyperkähler structures also descend. So in other words, we know that the flag varieties are integrable systems of gelfand tilson type, and the component coming from the loops gives an integrable system of Lipoisson type. So we want to ask, do all these integrable systems descend to the quotient? And to study, uh, to study this, we want to see the appearance of the right number of invariants in our system. So what we're going to do is we're going to consider generalized hyperpolygons with C complete arms and N minus C minimal arms. So the minimal, this, this hyperpolygon will have minimal arms, which will have only labels one R, and it will have complete arms and only those two options, C complete and N minus C minimal arm. We, within the complete arms, we have K, the Kth arrow giving us K by K blocks, each contributing K invariants. These are Hamiltonians for the gelfand tilson type systems. So let me uh, show you for these type of hyperpolygons, which uh, invariants appear within our system. Uh, so let's go over these invariants. From the gelfand tilson type integrable system, giving complete flags, we have the one plus two plus blah, 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 plus R invariants, and this uh, multiplied by the number of complete flags that we had, uh, we get C times R minus one uh, times R over two invariants from there. Then we have the minimal flags. From the minimal flags, we have R minus one multiplied by the number of minimal flags, which is N minus C. And finally, from the loops, we have G, G of the loops, R squared minus one, since they are in SLRC. So then for each choice of R and G and C, we can show that the hyperkähler reduction by the SCR action fixes a number, let's call it N of those invariants. And we can show that uh, this number using normal forms for matrices appearing in the central node, we can show that it's actually a really good number. So let me call it uh, N of R and G C. It depends on all of those invariants. And what we can do is once we subtract those to the total number of invariants, we have we get half the dimension of hyperpolygon space like we wanted. And this leads to um, our main theorem with Steve Ryan, which is that the space XG sub R of alpha is a completely integrable simultaneous system of gelfand tilson type. And one of the interesting things, one of one of the surprising things here. Uh, so what's interesting is that this integral system, it shows the existence of sub-integral systems within meromorphic Hitchin systems, which do not see the complex geometry of the algebraic curve. This is something that should lead to some new understanding of the whole space of meromorphic Hitchin systems, since it's purely representation theoretic construction of sub-integral systems. Remember that when you're trying to show uh, that the Hitchin system is an integrable system, you need to go to the Hitchin side or to Higgs bundle perspective. You need to use the complex structure of the Riemann surface, look at the Hitchin base in terms of uh, differentials on the surface. What we're constructing here is something from a different perspective, something from the perspective of representation uh, space, and we're not taking into account the complex structure of the Riemann surface. So that's uh, quite uh, novel from this perspective. 
Moreover, we have a hypercalar structure, and so we can consider the appearance of Lagrangians or complex holomorphic subvarieties within these interval systems, leading us to consider brains of interval systems. So what I want to do next is I want to tell you about brains, uh, both of uh, in general for interval systems, for your favorite interval systems or hypercalar spaces, and then I want to talk about brains for Hitchin systems and hypercalar spaces. So if you haven't seen brains before, let me just remind you uh, that this is one of the ways that we can think of them. So recall that when you have a hypercalar variety, uh, we can fix quaternions i, j, k and corresponding symplectic forms omega i, omega j, omega k, and consider the compatibility of subspaces with those structures. So we consider a subspace, whether it's a holomorphic subvariety with respect to a complex structure, whether it's a Lagrangian subvariety with respect to one of the symplectic forms. So we're going to borrow the terminology from string theory, simplify it a little bit here, and say the following. We're going to say that a complex subvariety with respect to one of the complex structures is a B brain. And we're going to say that a Lagrangian subvariety with respect to one of the symplectic forms is an A brain. And if you haven't seen this before, remember that Lagrangians and A brains both have A's. So that's where the A brain comes from. I'm saying we're simplifying a little bit because if you look at string theoretic papers, then you'd see that actually brains are subspaces which support hyperholomorphic shapes on top. And I'm going to forget about the things that are supported. I'm just going to, to think of the support itself as the brain uh, because that's complicated enough. So when we consider the whole, the whole hypercalar space um, for which we fixed three complex structures, i, j, and k in that order, we uh, may find triples of brains uh, so these triple brains are spaces that satisfy certain conditions with respect to each of the complex structures in that order. So you can have ABAs, AAAs, ABs, BAAs, and BBB brains, where each of these letters represents an A brain or a B brain for that complex structure. So if you have an ABA, it's a Lagrangian subvariety with respect to omega i and omega k, but it's a complex subvariety with respect to uh, j. And in particular, you can't have AAA because things would be Lagrangian with respect to the three symplectic forms, but that would imply that it's actually a vanishing uh, symplectic form. So you, the non-degeneracy would go away because of the relation that comes from the quaternionic structures. Uh, the BBB brains, you may wonder what they are. They're hyperholomorphic uh, brains. A, a point is they're hyperkähler subvarieties, so they're complex subvarieties with respect to everyone. Uh, a point, the whole space, but it's also our, our brains coming from a representations into a subgroup, a complex subgroup that would also give you a BBB brain, uh, but it's also hard to get um, brains of all of these types. So which questions do I like asking about these brains for my favorite hypercalar spaces, which you might find in your favorite hypercalar spaces? So let me call MGC, the modular space of Higgs bundles, for, or the Hitchin system for a complex group GC. Uh, in this setup, uh, we have the Hitchin vibration, the integral system. And the things that I want to ask uh, are how to construct families of brains of Higgs bundles uh, and how to understand these brains. Uh, how, how do they lie within the integral system? And how do they relate to representations? Remember that Hitchin systems and the space of representations of your Riemann surface are in correspondence via non abelian Hodge theory. So how do these brains relate to representations? There's also a duality appearing. So through uh, Saslow, Strominger, and Yao's correspond uh, conjecture, there, there is a conjectural perspective of Hitchin systems to um, the dual, the Langlands dual group, the Hitchin system for the Langlands dual group, which I wrote here as MGCL, and mirror symmetry is conjectured to be um, the correspondence that appears here. Now, this correspondence has to be understood uh, for the non singular fibers of this vibration, and homological mirror symmetry relates in for, for the brains themselves, relates the Fukaya category of one of the spaces of so the A brains to the derived category of coherent shifts of the other one. 
so, which are B brains. So it relates A brains and B brains. And I want to ask, what are the dual objects? Once you construct your favorite brains in, in such an integral system, what are dual objects in the dual space? And also which other brains can be constructed? We appear in another kind of duality. So here I put it as an M in violet at the bottom. Um, which other dualities are there with other moduli spaces that fiber over the same base and which have brains inside uh, with some kind of correspondence? And this is the kind of questions that I've asked for Steve uh, Bradlow a few years ago. Moreover, as I was mentioning, in some of these integrable systems, there are singular fibers. I put them here in violet. Uh, so since uh, mirror symmetry and as why is that is not truly understood for the singular fibers over the singular locus, you can think of this as just your favorite integral system or your kitchen systems, the fibers which lie over singular points of the Hitchin base. Um, if you're thinking through, uh, say, spectral data or the spectral covers for Hitchin systems are points over singular uh, reducible spectral covers. I want to ask, how do you construct brains uh, that lie completely inside singular fibers? So do we have brains just completely inside this uh, singular uh, that you see here, panked, uh, pinched tori? Uh, how do these brains uh, relate to their dual in the dual system and can they be abelianized one of the nice things of this integrable system is that Hitchin showed that it could be seen as abelian compact abelian varieties the fibers can we abelianize brains which lie completely in inside the singular fibers so these are the type of questions i'm asking not just for higgs bundles and Hitchin systems and the Hitchin vibration but more generally for uh, for hypercalar spaces, and in particular hypercalar spaces which have an integral system structure. So uh, generalized hyperpolygons fit very nicely into this area. Um, so a bit of history of brains. Um, brains were studied, have been studied for a while, but brains within the, the area of Hitchin systems were first considered by Kapustin and Wiesen back in 2006 in terms of sigma models in their electromagnetic duality paper. Later on, together with uh, some of my collaborators, with David Baraglia and then with Sebastian Heller, and some with this was we consider the first uh, the first methods to construct families of brains which generate consistently the four types of brains that should be, uh, that are allowed within the space of Hitchin systems and that which are related to each other. So what I want to tell you next is how to do this, how to construct these families of brains and how can we generalize them to other settings and in particular to generalize hyperpolygons. And the key idea here is to build these brains is by considering symmetries, uh, symmetries of the system that we have. We have a complex, Higgs bundle on a complex Riemann surface. And so there are several structures that we can add in order to add symmetries and look at invariant objects. Uh, so we're going to employ symmetries to the whole space. And these are the symmetries that I'm going to think uh, first. There are three structures that I want to impose in our system. First is the real structure F on the Riemann surface. Um, I'm going to call sigma, which is an anti-holomorphic involution. And if it has fixed points, those would be fixed circles within the surface. And the structure has two invariants, which are given by the number of such circles, as well as whether those circles divide the surface into two or not. And this is the setup that we studied with David Baraglia, which I'll tell you more in a second. Then I want also to add a real structure to the complex group, an anti-holomorphic involution uh, that I call here tau. Uh, that fixes the real form of the group. And I'm most interested in non-compact setup since this brings the most interesting uh, scenarios. And this leads to real Higgs bundles, uh, which is what I started studying um, a while back when I got into the area. And this is what we extended with uh, David also within the framework of families of brains. And finally, I'm going to consider a finite group action, this gamma on the surface. And I'm going to consider equivariant representations. This is what we looked at with Sebastian Heller, and which we more recently studied with Biswas. Um, by looking at this uh, induced action of these three involutions, 
on the whole modelized space of complex Higgs bundles, we can define invariant spaces. And these invariant spaces will give our brains of all possible types. And the nice thing is that these methods can be extended, in particular, they were developed later um, and extended later to different setups, for instance, to frame instantons, to Higgs bundles on K3s, and more recently to quiver varieties. So I'll tell you more about how to look at these brains within the Hitchin setup. I'll tell you a little bit about how Schaffhauser and Hoskin extended it to quiver varieties and how with Steve Bryan, we, uh, we explored a different perspective of these involutions into generalized hyperpolygons, uh, which doesn't overlap with uh, Schaffhauser and Hoskins. So the four types of brains that we can have were ABA, BBB, BAA, and AAB, and this is uh, how we can build the spaces. With the real structure on the surface, um, this F with uh, David Baraglia, we showed that one obtains the real integrable system given by ABA brains, which actually relates to three manifolds in a very interesting way. So I'll tell you a little bit more about it in a, in a few minutes. With a real structure on the group, uh, one gets a BAA brain of uh, the type originally considered by Kapustin and Witten in their paper. It's just that they weren't thinking about uh, about involutions in that way. And these involutions bring back real Higgs bundles as introduced by Hitching back in 92. We, we first studied these brains. I studied them by myself first, and then with, uh, with Baraglia, with Hitching, with Bradlow, Franco. This was with a few collaborators. We looked at, at real brains and how do they relate to, to each other via uh, dualities and how they can be abelianized and non-abelianized. Um, there are very interesting features that I can tell you more about um, later on. And then you can try and mix and match these structures. So mixing both real structures on the group and on the surface, we get an AAB brain of pseudo real Higgs bundles, which we show with Baraglia that it's also an integrable system. And finally, considering equivariant Higgs bundles under a finite group action, we obtain BBB brains with Sebastian Heller uh, and these actually, we showed that it's a vibration of, in terms of print varieties in certain settings. But we did it for SL2 Higgs bundles, so it's still widely open to consider Hitching systems for higher groups, higher rank groups, and understand what these equivariant Hitching systems uh, look like in terms of brains. So before we carry on and look into hyperpolygons, I want to tell you a few words about. Uh, how these three manifolds are related to Hitchin systems, since I find that quite interesting. So there is a question that many people have asked concerning three manifolds whose boundary is the Riemann surface, which is about which representations of the fundamental group of the Riemann surface extend to that of a three manifold. Within our setup, we consider a particular three manifold bounding a Riemann surface, which is obtained by taking the product of the Riemann surface with an interval, say minus one, one, and quotient by the action of the real structure F that we had and minus T. So you are sending X T to F of X minus T. And in this way, what we get is a three manifold, which naturally bounds a Riemann surface and most uh, familiar three manifolds can actually be put in this way. So once you have your three manifold written like this in terms of F, in such setting, those we, we want to ask which Higgs bundles extend. And these Higgs bundles over the three manifold, when considered over the fixed circles, they create actually an invariant because the vector bundle is sent to itself. So over each circle, there's a choice of plus or minus one. Um, so if you think, let me put it this way, if you think of a Higgs bundle that uh, belongs to the ABA brain of invariant Higgs bundles under the induced action, the induced involution of the real structure F on the modulized space of Higgs bundles uh, over the fixed circles sends the vector bundle to itself. And so for each peak circle, there is a choice of plus or, minus, plus or minus one for each dimension of your vector bundle. So it defines the twisted K theory class of the vector bundle E. And there's, this is a new class that, uh, a new class of the bundle that we didn't think of before, which now can tell us about 
which representations extend. So what we could show with David Baraglia was that uh, the representations that extend within this setup are those corresponding to Higgs bundles in our ABA brain uh, for which twisted K-theoretic class uh, is trivial for the vector bundle. So it allows us to have a very clean way of knowing which representations extend from, um, from a fundamental group to another. Uh, so this is one of the, the main theorems of, of our paper on, on ABA brains from a few years ago. So to finish off, uh, remember we were talking about brains for Higgs bundles and, and hybrid polygons. I want to finish off by talking about hybrid polygon spaces. Having seen the constructions of brains done for Higgsian systems and the type of questions we ask within this setup, I want to ask the same questions or very similar ones for hyperpolygons. So which type of brains can be built within the space of general hyperpolygons? What are their dual spaces via mirror symmetry and how do they lie within our integrable systems? So expanding on the work on involutions, Hoskins on, on the work on involutions on Higgs bundles that I showed you just uh, done with David Baraglia, Hoskins and Schaffhauser considered a few years ago brains for minimal rank two hyperpolygons for genus zero surfaces. So remember, we this is hyperpolygons with no generalization, is genus zero and the rank two, and they looked into some type of brains. So what we want to do with Steve Ryan is we want to uh, begin constructing families of triple brains through involutions which do not lie within the setup of Hoskins and Schaffhauser, uh, but which would encompass the higher rank bundles, Higgs bundles. Um, this is something that we're mostly uh, doing in a forthcoming paper, but we included in the paper that I mentioned before, um, in memory of Atiyah, we included a first example that I'll show you here to give a hint um, of what we're uh, interested in. So let me conclude this part of the talk by telling you uh, about this example. Consider now the involution. I'm going to give you one involution as an example. Uh, in an involution of generalized hyperpolygons, which negates the cotangent directions. So this is, we have sigma that sends x, y, a, b to x minus y, a minus b. The fixed point set of this involution is given by precisely the hyperpolygons, which have vanishing cotangent directions. Uh, or in other words, it is precisely the space of generalized, the generalized polygons of the same length alpha. So, then we consider the compatibility with the complex structures and the symplectic forms like we did with Hitchin systems. And we can show that this space is the BAA brain within the space of generalized hyperpolygons. Uh, so this is a very neat example of BAA brain. And let me just finish now by taking, uh, talking about the, the research that I mentioned on other projects um, related to geometry, but not so much uh, with hyperpolygon spaces. You, you can see more on hyperpolygon spaces, both on the papers that I mentioned before and on the work that will appear eventually once the pandemic uh, has settled uh, that we're doing with Steve Bryan, uh, which is uh, taking a bit longer because of my restrictions on work hours. So what else have I been thinking about? And we have about 15 minutes left, I planned. I want to tell you a bit more about other projects where I'm trying to put geometry both to the reach of other sciences and um, younger generations. So we've been interested a lot on trying to explain Hitchin systems to, uh, to early graduate students or undergrad students. With, with Steve Ryan, we also prepared recently um, an, an overvolfer snapshot of geometry. So it's Higgs bundles without geometry, actually, where we explain how vector bundles can be seen as hedgehogs, the hair of a hedgehog, where over each part of the hair of the skin, you have a hair, which is a dimension one space, and how the Higgs field twists this, uh, this vector bundle. So it twists this hedgehog. This is actually the image that we prepared for our paper that was published uh, last year. We've also tried to, I've been trying to um, visualize Hitchin systems. So this is the cover of the notices, which was the Hitchin vibration I prepared for my article on applications of graph theory come together with Hitchin system come through this generalized hyperpolygon perspective I've uh, embarked into in the last year or two. 
I've also been very interested in the few, last few years in understanding geometric structures within um, within other areas of science, in particular within uh, viruses and and just crystal and crystals, which are other structures which become very interesting. So I, uh, with a student, we just took a few years ago. We looked into how crystals can be modeled when there are planars. In particular, we were interested in snowflakes because there weren't fully developed models for understanding snowflake growth. And we contributed by understanding planar snowflakes and how they grow. Another thing that uh, was uh, bugging me was how to understand viral structures. There's one type of, some types of viruses which are dodecahedral viruses, which uh, have certain symmetries within their subunits. And the interesting thing is that nature gives you some constraints on which type of uh, relations that those subunits can have, but also dodecahedral symmetries from the mathematical perspective give you restrictions. And if you put those together, you can try and understand which viruses should exist mathematically, but haven't been found scientifically or vice versa, which viruses have uh, been found and haven't been classified mathematically. So there was a lack of classification of the dodecahedral viruses with certain properties, uh, in particular with um, with certain type of symmetrons as subunits. And this is what we did with my students, um, Kaisi and Anj. We classified dodecahedral viruses with all types of uh, symmetrons as subunits. And now it's actually a nice paper that appears in surveys as a uh, part of classification of viral structures. And viruses have been of interest for a while to me. Um, I've been interested in epidemics before this um, side epidemic appeared here. Uh, I've been trying to understand how epidemics spread when we have symmetry within the structures of our society or a network. Uh, so with a student, uh, Anling Zhang, we, um, we modeled uh, how viruses spread in networks which have cliques, which uh, ideally, so I, I proposed to her to study this thinking of epidemics that would start in classrooms, in schools or universities, where everyone's connected to each other. And I've asked her how, how can we model this spread? How quickly would it spread if we keep our classrooms open, um, ironically? Uh, this was a very nice paper that uh, was very simple. The geometry made it quite simple, the symmetry. It, it gave us some insight into some interesting settings. She actually won many prizes, uh, like hundreds of thousands of dollar prizes, because uh, as students, these uh, kind of projects apparently are very, uh, very catchy and they were catchy also um, for the media. So with a, a more recently, I published in the proceedings of the Royal Society from the UK, uh, a model where we looked into the more theoretic perspective of networks and percolation, bootstrap percolation models for uh, networks with symmetry and multi-type um, setting. My inspiration was trying to think of how to, uh, this was inspired back in 2020, 2019. How do fake news spread? Uh, when should you trust something that someone tells you? And how can we put a, a bound on this? So can we say that we trust something if at least say three different types of people have told you this information? If your friend, your family, and a store, uh, manager tells you this information, then you start trusting it. So these different types of people have to tell you different, the same information, and then you trust it. And um, this was a trust model. We called it for spreading gossip. We it got into several media outlets um, because hopefully it can help us model how both uh, not just fake news or gossip spread, but also how to give different vaccinations uh, for viral spread. Uh, which would stop if you have three different types, then you stop uh, a spread, say. Uh, so more recently, when the pandemic started last year, uh, back in January, we had a lot of data from, uh, from Washington State on uh, the outbreak here in the US. And it became interesting to try and understand the different uh, age divisions in the spread. And we started trying to understand how vaccinations, back in the time there was no vaccination, how vaccinations could be structured depending on age so that we could 
maximize their use and minimize the ICU units used in hospitals. So with my student, uh, I should mention maybe these all of these students are actually uh, high school students that I take for a year and I give them projects to do uh, under my supervision. So with these students, I ask him to, to try and model uh, this age structure susceptible, infected and recover model for COVID-19 type viruses. And we did a um, vaccination strategy based on that. It was public in published uh, recently in Nature scientific reports, um, and it gave an insight into this vaccination strategy. But I've also been interested in behavioral science and how can we uh, see patterns, the same patterns that I'm looking in from the geometric perspective, I'm looking at patterns in behaviors. Uh, we did recently uh, with a student visual round, we looked into how to use machine learning. I've been interested in in machine learning in the last few years, after taking some classes in, uh, in Stanford of AI. Uh, so I asked him how to understand machi with machine learning, the relation between emotions and colors. Um, we did this paper on continuous emotion extrapolation uh, and uh, color related to the emotions in different countries. Uh, the other co-authors, this was our first paper with neuroscientists, which apparently once they give you a data set, they need to be co-authors in your paper, uh, which I wasn't aware, but this is how it happened. And um, then also I, I would be interested with my husband to start uh, studying behavioral be uh, science. And we looked into uh, what we called, we introduced the, the concept of uh, phone walkers, just like you have a, phone, a, a dog walker you can walk your phone without using it, as you can see in these images below that we made. And this was published in uh, Behavior, one of the top journals in behavioral science and caught by a few, again, media outlets like MIT Technology Review and so on about phone walkers, which are kind of like zombie walkers of phones without using. Uh, now the pandemic keeps going and uh, I'm not looking at COVID anymore, but I've been more interested this year in understanding a very curious mold called Fizarium. Uh, that's a mold that's a clever unicellular organism that kind of knows where food and, and other sources of um, energy are without seeing them. Obviously, it doesn't have any eyes, but it can detect them. And so we can actually uh, produce using this mold and uh, a model that we made, there was usually, there was only available a, a model for a, a one cell of this mold and how it behaved. So we produced a model where we put many cells of this mold and we make it behave under the natural conditions we know of. And then it finds, for instance, minimal trees, minimal connecting graphs between a set of nodes that we give it. We, we declare sources of energy there and the mold knows where those are and creates minimal networks. And so with this, we can actually look into how would the mold create a minimal rail track, say, in the United States, and it creates your ideal minimizing graph there. Um, so we started with just making the model of many cells, and this is our first paper, cell fusion through slime mold network dynamic, and then we created the, the uses of this uh, to create a stainer tree algorithm, uh, both with my student, Cheryl Sue, and my brother, uh, Fidel, and we applied it to topological surfaces to also create minimal graphs within topological surfaces. Um, and finally, just uh, I have a couple of minutes left. Finally, I've been also interested in uh, trying to reach others uh, in, and convince them to do outreach. So we've written a few papers on Sonia Kovalevsky days, which are days for women in science, uh, trying to push minorities to do science. And the papers that we prepare with, uh, with James, with my husband, it are about how to organize these events, how to produce uh, material for these events. There's a big um, list of sources that we compiled uh, to try and help. Uh, and on the left, you see one of the papers I published in the Europeans Math uh, Society newsletter about teaching uh, mathematics and doing work really with a toddler or children at home. As you can imagine, it has been quite hard this pandemic with children at home. You don't get much time to, to do anything. And that's a photo of me trying to teach counting to a one and a half year old uh, whilst trying to do some research at the same time. 
And so this has been my work in the last few years. Uh, let me finish by just advertising a conference that I'm hoping is going to be the reunion of, uh, of my area of geometry and geometric structures, Hitchin systems. And uh, we're planning this big conference in 2022. Hopefully the pandemic will be over by right then. It's going to be a week here at UIC. I'm organizing with uh, Brian Collar. Uh, there are going to be many plenary talks from all over the world, mini courses for students, their support. I'm planning to support everyone that comes. We're expecting about a hundred people, everything paid for everyone, boat tours, lots of fun, social activities that we've been missing for the last few years and lots of very interesting talks and work to be done uh, all together. So if you know of anyone, just go to this website and uh, sign up for the support that we're already taking applications. Thank you for listening and that's all for today. Thank you. It's uh, amazing how busy you've been uh, in the last year and a half. Quite impressive. I uh, have, it's not, uh, yeah. I'm trying to survive. <laughs> I think, I think you're just... doing well, yeah. Okay. Um, so we have maybe some time for questions. Uh, are there, uh, have, one very lateral question that maybe I prefer to open to the audience first. Oh, you can start, we can start with you if you want. And then if anyone, you can also, people can email me questions too. I'm very happy to answer via email. Okay, maybe I will ask. So on those um, non obviously geometric, not obviously geometric problems or non geometric problems, at least in appearance, that you've mentioned. Um, do any of them actually have any geometry beyond the one in the symmetry? Uh, so the, the one in the symmetries for the virus, um, I looked a bit into it at some point for a different reason, but well, maybe not a different mm -hmm. reason. Um, yeah. Uh, but is there, I mean, do you find Higgs bundles on any of these problems or not really? I haven't tried to define Higgs bundles on any of these problems, but uh, my collaborator, Steve Ryan, as I mentioned, um, he's my main collaborator currently. Uh, he's also taken in the last year this, uh, side, we call it side math, where we do some other stuff. He's doing quantum materials and he's actually been able to define Hitchin systems within quantum materials. Um, quantum so, materials? Yeah. What's a quantum material? Uh, you. you we need to ask him if he's not here now okay, today. Okay, okay. Uh, but you can uh, you can think of um, you you've heard of quantum computing. So it's it's along the same lines of quantum computing. Mm. Uh, but uh, nanomaterials too. I don't know how he's doing it. I, I looked at his he has a nice paper actually uh, that was published on science advances. Uh, last month or so, mm. and there's another one coming with Hitchin systems, uh, which uh, has made me think I should actually try to put Hitchin systems into and see how they fit within these other areas. I mm. think because Hitchin systems are so natural, um, mainly because we're just talking about a connection, right, on a Riemann surface under certain conditions, in principle, we can think of it, say, we're looking at this um, standard tree algorithm on torus or, or a sphere, we can try to think the, the vertices of this tree as the points where this connection will have zeros and uh, we can make quite a neat connection between these objects. Um, but I haven't, I haven't tried. Um, usually, yeah, I have this problem where I get bored of stuff after a while, so I have to change to yeah. keep going. Yeah, well, that's good, it's not this thing. Okay, uh, any other questions, comments? You can just unmute yourself if you want to ask, or you can put it in the chat and I'm happy to, to voice it. Uh, okay, can I ask a question? So, you, uh, so uh, at some point you mentioned the, uh, the, the relation between flag variety and the, and the girl on the Zetany? Between correctly. what? Let me do, sorry, between what? Uh, between uh, flag variety and the girl on the Zetany. Yes. So can you can you say a little bit more about that? Uh, let me just go back to. 
the screen. Uh, so here. Right. Yes. What What was your question again? So, so um, how do I see this? Uh, uh, this uh, could hand could end the space of this gives me like uh, uh, what what do you mean gap on the in type actually? What do I mean? It yeah, gap on the in type is so is uh, uh, there is also an integral system there. Yes. Or yeah. So uh, yes. And uh, as far as I know, that's created by you know this. Uh, this in, uh, a sequence of embedding uh, of, uh, for, for example, in type A, a sequence of embedding of SL uh, and minus mm -hmm. one to SL n. So how do I yes. see, yeah, how do I relate uh, that with this one? So you're looking at the matrices that come from the, from the star shape quiver. I, I, uh, okay. So each of these, uh, each of these flags comes from one of these, um, uh, let me just put you the quiver here, the big quiver. So I'm interested in this quiver, right? This is a generalized one. So the Gelf right. and Tilson type systems come from uh, from each of these arms. So okay. we're, th yeah. we're thinking of each of these arms. When we build the moment map, partially was trying to understand how the arrows, so that we're thinking of the matrices in each type, right? Uh, okay. How to conjugate them or how to, uh, Multiply them in the in the correct way to give a good moment map. Okay. So the Gelfan the Gelfan Tilson comes from from the arms here, uh, and see. the Lipozon okay. one comes from from the central node. I don't know if you're seeing my arrow or not. I don't know how. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I can see that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yes. And so we're trying to put together these moment maps that we built from each of these faces into one I together see. yeah i see okay Thank and there, yeah mm -hmm. as, no no problem thank you it's a good question actually it took us a while you know it, it took quite a few hours on the board to try and figure out the correct way of of seeing these multiplications uh, how, how to put them in the natural way that would allow uh -huh. us to get the right number of invariants and and get things cancel out in the way that gelf and tilson uh, type systems cancel out yeah okay thank you Thank you. Thank you. Uh, other questions or comments? Okay, so let's thank Laura. Again. Thank, you. thank you. And it was good to see you. Uh, okay, thank you so very much. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, there's one more talk this, no, sorry, two more talks this year, one on Thursday and then the next one on the Tuesday after, and then we stop till uh, the 11th of January, I believe, or something like that. All right. Anyway, you'll get an email about it. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.